Pornhub should be criminally charged and their executives should be behind bars, period. They have operated too long illegally hosting abuse content. Pornhub is scared. Mike Farley said on tape, there was a time when we would go through videos and the only videos we would reject were where someone was literally getting murdered. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today's episode is a special movers and shakers edition. We're going to be occasionally doing these sorts of shows to feature people who are doing things that are very important in our culture and our political world. These people are taking risks. They're going maybe undercover. They're running for office. They're doing things up against a Goliath, an enemy that we all share, something negative in our culture, and they're fighting for what is good, true, and beautiful. Today, we'll be featuring Peter Hernandez, a father, a small business owner, a proud immigrant, who is running for California District 18. He's running for office. He's doing it in a very blue state. As you know, I'm California and I love my state, but our state is full of many anti-life, anti-family, and in many ways anti-faith politicians who have taken over the state. Peter Hernandez is talking about how he plans to take back California and how his work and what he's doing running for office in Central California can be part of that strategy to win back this state. So you're not going to want to miss what he has to say. And then we're also going to hear from Arden Young. Arden Young is a young activist who I really had a soft spot in my heart for when I found out about her work because she does undercover investigative reporting of not Planned Parenthood, but of Pornhub, of one of the biggest pornography websites on the planet. And her work has led to attorneys general opening an investigation and working to demand justice for the victims of Pornhub. So this very young woman, you're gonna love to hear her story, what motivates her, as well as the very important work that she's doing, exposing Pornhub with the organization Sound Investigations, which is run in collaboration with another person I admire, a young man named Eric Cochran. Eric Cochran is someone who actually was a whistleblower over at Pinterest a few years ago. Yes, the popular website that shares pictures. If you're listening and you got married recently or you like home decor, you probably use Pinterest. I'm banned on Pinterest because Pinterest, if you didn't know this already, is a very pro-abortion anti-life company. And Eric Cochran was one of their engineers, one of their leading engineers, actually. He was fired after being a whistleblower at Pinterest, showing, revealing that they had listed live action and myself as pornography on the website in order to block our content, our pro-life content, from being viewed, and that this was done intentionally at Pinterest in order to block pro-life content on the platform. Afterwards, Pinterest would ban live action permanently for no fault except that we put out pro-life content. Meanwhile, Pinterest is actually putting out pro-abortion content, allowing abortionists to not just be on the site, but to advertise through those little cute squares abortion services, as they call them, on Pinterest. So Arden Young, working with Eric Cochran over at Sound Investigations, has a bombshell investigation of Pornhub. You're going to want to hear what she has to say. I hope listening to Peter and Arden, you can be inspired by their initiative and their courage. Also, for those who are watching on YouTube, you might notice this new background. I'm very excited about our set evolution. So hope you enjoy the evolving new set of the Lila Rose podcast. Thanks for listening. Before we get started, a big thanks to our sponsor, the Amen app. The Amen app is a project of the Augustine Institute, and it is a free prayer app that you can download directly to your phone. This is the season of Lent. We are at a time when people, many of us, are preparing our hearts for Easter and drawing closer to God. The Amen app is a great tool that you can use for guided prayers, meditations, hearing Holy Scripture, even children's stories, sleep stories. The content on it is great, and it's very simple and easy to use. And using the Amen app with just a few minutes of your time while you're driving or doing dishes or commuting or whatever you're doing, you can use just a few minutes to draw closer to God. So you can download the Amen app today for free using the link in the podcast description notes and use the Amen app this season to draw closer to God and deepen your prayer life. Peter Hernandez, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thank you for having me, Lila. I've heard a lot of great things about you and your very important campaign to help save California. Um, You're running for Congress here in the state. It's a tough, tough battle. But let's start with your background. You know, what what is your background and what motivated you to, as a pro-life or run for uh, run for election in this crazy state? It's funny because as as uh, as I think about when I first got elected, 
really reflecting on on the why that 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 definitely came up uh amongst the support the, <clears throat> the support group and it really is a mission field i mean i think when it comes to running for office <clears throat> it's a new mission field because the reality of politics is it, it's broken uh everything's very top down and and i you know as god put it on my heart there is no way to understand how to fix something if you don't if you're not involved right if you're not a part of it so i ran 2014 got elected to the school board uh started understanding better what what exactly was the function of the school system and the school board uh the board member authority and then uh running for county supervisor serving four years and it's funny how you i felt like i got thrown into the deep end of the pool lila uh 2018 getting elected 2020 the covid pandemic hit i was right in the middle of it with the lockdowns and the mandates and as a strong conservative Christian, I understood that there's an authority that ultimately that we have by the people, right? The consent of the governed. And, uh, you know, I, I, I felt like it, it just, there was just moments in time when I, I reflected on why, um, you know, ultimately the, the constitution has so much power, but it's not used, right? It's a muscle that's yet to be flexed and used. And so I did it in 2020. I challenged the public health officer and the mandates. And uh, and sure enough, it's funny because I know I didn't have the votes in that room to oppose it. I brought forward an informed consent resolution as an example. But uh, the big conviction that I had is the silence in the room. The silence is, to me, equates to the silence in the public. So long and short, I just found myself knowing that God called me to this because it's not even so much about having the votes in the room, but starting the conversation with the culture, because really the battles in the culture to win them back to really uh, give them that citizenship mindset that they take their their responsibility, their duly responsibility um, to be involved, to 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 be game changers in their environment. So I really didn't feel like I was the one um, doing the biggest game changing. Besides the fact that I was there to educate the public on their duty and their their uh, authority. So um, so I just wanted to. I made the, I I swam in the deep end of the pool challenge the lockdowns, the mandates, the public health officer quit two hours later. And sure enough, it created, I think, a ripple effect of not just support, but ultimately a conversation. Um, so that's why I just felt just validated in why I, I ran for office and getting elected. Um, it's a calling for sure. Peter, what part of California are you running in? So I'm running Congressional District 18. It's the central coast of California. Uh, there's four counties, Monterey, San Benito, Santa Cruz, in South Santa Clara, it actually just got added into through the redistricting process. It got added in those three brand new counties. It's a majority now official Latino district. Um, and there's a lot to be said about the, the votes of the Latino community and the pro-life sentiment. Absolutely. OK, so tell me why you're so pro-life and then also how you plan to reach the Latino community, because I know that that is like you're saying, part of the future for California. That's right. So. Like I mentioned, um, so my background is is we I'm a first generation Mexican American. My my whole family is uh majority Latino. I mean I'm their first generation from Mexico, so they're obviously from um for they they have the traditional value background. That's what I came from. That's what I that's what I've always known, right? I mean, my mom used to say you're born Catholic, you're gonna die a Catholic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I went I went through confirmation and and, and baptism. So all that to be said is coming into this country, um, I, I realized that there's blessings that God's given this nation when it comes to my pro-life sentiment. I mean, we came here because of the fact that my family wanted a new opportunity. My mother and my father, who um, stayed together in spite of my dad going through his struggles as, a, as an alcoholic, he was very abusive. The laws in Mexico didn't allow, or I should say, um, the system in Mexico uh, to a certain extent, uh, you know, uh, uh, created an opportunity for that abuse. So that by default was a, re um, a compelling reason for my mom to say, let's start all over. Let's go to, uh, to, to America. And, uh, and it's funny because I didn't even realize till my, my mom almost passed. She told me that when, before we came to this country, um, because of my dad's abuse, my mom had basically had two miscarriages and, uh, um, my my uh the the people that surrounded my mother basically had advised her to divorce my father um and and if she would have listened to them she had a strong conviction that she wasn't supposed to um and obviously that doesn't encourage abuse that's not my that's not my sentiment but 
you just never know, I guess is my biggest statement. You don't know the decisions that you make and the consequences that come from those decisions. And my mom, if she wouldn't have picked um, staying with my father, I wouldn't have been born. And um, and then fast forward, me as a father, now being, being a, a father myself, trying to learn from the past and not repeat the mistakes of my father, um, I've had my two children. I've done my best to honor God and to live a good life. That doesn't come without its struggles. Both my children, I have a three-year-old and a nine-year-old. Both of them came up through the genetic testing with physical uh, issues. One had uh, um, an atrophied uh, kidney. And, you know, technically there was worries that it could, that, that the other one could, could be negatively, negatively be impacted by it and could potentially die and obviously cause a lot of headache and heartache and, and medical bills. Same thing with my daughter. She was born with Turner syndrome and we didn't know how extreme it would be until she would be born. So we didn't know she would come out with serious malformations, heart issues, you name it. I mean, we were scared both times. But that's the profound thing about faith, Lila, as you know, that, you know, as God delivers, he gives you just this hope that there's something better and you don't know the outcomes. And sure enough, uh, not only am I blessed to live in this country, but my two children are thriving. They're doing really well. Um, and and how do you replace the memories that now have officially been created of the blessings of those li- of, of those beautiful little lives? Um, my my young my son is he's profound. Like he's so articulate, very cl- very clear minded. He's such a student. Um, he loves history. He 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 watches documentaries for fun on World <laughs> War Two. I mean, anyway, so I can go on and on. But the bottom line is is there's very profound reasons why life. Um, when you pursue it, it has evident benefits and, and um, it doesn't come without pain, but life mm-hmm. is not, he does not have struggles. And, uh, and I think as Latino community has struggled in, you know, in this country, we've known that life isn't easy and we've always had this mindset of work has dignity uh, and that you can't separate the two. And we come into this country and somehow now we're supposed to be part of a system that gives us entitlements and benefits that actually do less to preserve our dignity and more to destroy the culture and the traditions that matter to us. Um, so for all those reasons and a lot more, I feel like life is the core issue. It is the dominant issue. And the one, I mean, this is the profound thing that I felt God put on my heart was the one that can define life can define all of life and can therefore can control all of it. And uh, I would not want to put that power in the hand of any man, including myself. Mm-hmm. I believe it belongs to God. Well said. So, Peter, you're in a really tough district. I mean, every district in California is tough uh, to varying degrees. The state is fully run uh, by Democrats, basically. I mean, very pro-abortion Democrats. Our Governor Gavin Newsom is super pro-abortion and, you know, pro-lockdown. Of course, he was partying uh, during the lockdowns that he was uh, demanding. So you just have a lot of hypocrisy, corruption, uh, pro-abortion, anti-family policies in the state. Tell us about your race. Do you think you can win and why? So 40% of California, that's kind of the biggest uh, elephant in the room that people don't speak about enough. 40% of the of the voting block of California is Latino. Uh, the Latinos is the majority in this state. Whoever wins the Latino vote wins this state. The hard part is, is for different reasons, they don't always show up to vote, right? And... Uh, and, but the reality is, is we're, there's very profound things that cause us, I think, as, as humans, as, indi- as individuals, on, on why we should be engaged. And I would argue that the family unit is one of them. We're seeing this very extreme sentiment that now wants to strip you of your right as a parent, wants to strip you of your right to preserve the interest of your family. Now you have children that are able to take uh, a, you know, get an abortion at 12 years old. They can take uh, hormone and, and sex uh, drugs basically without the parents' consent or even knowledge. Now, even insurances can actually provide for that health, that type of a, a, a service to our to a 12 year old. The Latino community doesn't under, doesn't know these things, right? They're they're hardworking people. They're involved in their lives, taking care of their kids. And uh, they basically haven't had their eye on the ball. But the funny thing is, is now when things are coming to a head and the issues are becoming very real because economically they're not doing as well. I mean, if you think about minorities, middle class folks, low income folks, a big chunk of them are Latinos. And that by default highlights the reality that they 
they're struggling and they're not, they're asking why. And a lot of them are not realizing or can't connect the dots of what are these issues that are causing their, their pain. And, uh, I, you know, I felt like, again, that's why it was my calling, getting involved, understanding these issues, being a county supervisor, knowing the legislative process, my authority, the state policies, all the things that negatively impact, um, our, our, our outcomes in our communities. And as I learn these things, as, uh, as I've gone out there and clearly articulated where these pain points are coming from, uh, there's an excitement there. When, you know, when a Latino hears that God established this nation, gave them inalienable rights, due process, separation of powers, um, you know, you're innocent before proven guilty, which is not the reality in Mexico, it's a profound thing for them to say, what is this freedom that we have? How do we fight for it and preserve it? And once they understand these very freedoms, they're hungry to do more. And us Latinos, we know how to do with very little to nothing. So money is is not the motivator. At the end of the day, you can get a very active, hungry Latino workforce to get out there and get out the vote and do the right thing. And I know we can do it. We just got to empower them. And that's the conviction that I had. We need a new, we, we need truly really need um, a servant's heart in public service, um, right? The the Bible says the, he, uh, the Lord didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for men. That means sacrificial attitude, a, a citizen's a citizen servant attitude. And I believe that's what people are hungry for. Once they see that in someone, I believe like me, um, they'll be, they'll be excited to get behind me. And that's what's happened in 22. I already ran in 22 and we, we did really well. All things considered, it was our first time. So now we played the ground floor for a, a very strong showing in 24. Peter, who are you up against? Who's your opposition? I'm up against Zoe Lofgren, a uh, very extreme uh, progressive left lady, and she's been in office for 27 years. She's never had a connection to this community um, by default, obviously. every When you think about the nature of this district, it's rural, it's agricultural, it's middle class, it's, it's Latino, it's everything I am and she's not. So, uh, She's up against something, and it's funny because I don't mind being the underdog. I actually kind of enjoy it because I think in a lot of ways she's overlooking me. Um, I'm re- I've am i done the hard work. I've been campaigning technically for three years, Lila. Mm-hmm. I haven't given up because, in, you know, I, I ran in 22, and it's been the, you know, technically it's a two-year race. But nonetheless, I knew that it, that it takes a lot longer than one election cycle when you're brand new to get your name out there. So we've done the work. We're putting our time in. And uh, our, my opponent, I think, is realizing that, which is why, uh, yeah, there's there's a big machine trying to trying to come up against me. But I know God's God's in my God's on my side. How are the polls looking, Peter? So there there's two polls, one done in the 2022 election and one just recently post election. And uh, there's definitely a shift happening. The three top issues are border security, violent crime. And then you're also uh, dealing with inflation. So the pain points, I mean, it's funny because these are majority Democrat voters that were polled and border security, right? Mm-hmm. Technically, the, the 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 great replacement theory is very, very true. Eight out of 10 people that are crossing the border illegally, when you think of even the preservation of life, right? Technically speaking, um, the, the sentiment of the Latino community coming into this country, wanting an opportunity. Now they're officially going to be replaced because eight out of 10 people that are crossing the border are no longer from Mexico. They're from every other nation. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's happening now. So jobs are officially going to become a weakened opportunity. Obviously the threats of of terrorism. Um, But when you look at violent crime, the decriminalization laws, the things that have made it easier for criminals basically to uh to to commit crimes nine hundred and fifty dollars no cash bail all these kind of things that are making it easier basically for the criminal to get away with things and for the innocent to be damaged right to be to be uh, um insecure in their persons and their property right I mean so there's so many things that are happening that these that the community this district the Latinos are very aware of now and honestly they're they're waiting to be courted I mean if anything what I can say about um, the party in general is they haven't done a good enough job of courting the Latino community. Because if we did that, if we talked to them, if we engaged them and said, look, we, we don't want to tell you what to believe. We just want to know where you're at and how we can help you and win them over. Uh, I know we can court them on our side. Technically speaking, the you know, when I when people ask me, are you Republican or Democrat, Peter? I say I'm a Republican, but because of my values, I'm not a Republican because of the party. 
my values make the party, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, so there is this strong sentiment of firming up the foundation under, I would argue, candidates like me that want to be able to advance a goal where it's not self-serving, where it's actually looking to make an effective change. I've said it before, I'm 100% okay with term limits. I get elected, I'm going to do a job. And I know that there's consultants and there's folks that tell me, Peter, you got to be careful what you say because you got to put yourself in a position to get elected. I would argue it's the opposite. The best thing that I could do is commit to doing a job, not worry about getting elected. When I get in there, actually do that job, and that might get me reelected. And if it doesn't, I'd be proud to serve just two years in Congress. But regardless, it will change the landscape of politics because people will be in there for the right reasons and not for the wrong reasons. It's the self-serving attitude that I think has destroyed the respect or the trust of the House of Representatives. So the GOP in California is not very strong. What has your support been like from the GOP? And then what are you looking for? How can people help your campaign and help you? So, I mean, as as is California fractured uh, when it comes to the GOP leadership, and I understand they're limited in resources, I would argue it's because of their top down system. Regardless, um, it's bottom up. It's empowering people. <clears throat> it's giving them the, uh, the organizational structure, we have, you know, we have a, a firm that's behind us, that's supporting us. And we obviously have uh, the, the the relationships that we've already built in the region. The, you know, we act, there's actually different organizations that are charters of the GOP, like the CRA, California Republican Assembly, that uh, they, they're building that workforce, they're getting the they're getting the, the ultimately the support system connected to get out the vote to do the the you know, ballot harvesting, working with their churches. I'm actually close to Pastor Rob McCoy um, in Southern California, Pastor Mike McClure up in San Jose region. So there is different um, organic groups that are working together, unifying the, the base and the voter base basically to get out the vote. When's the big day for the election? And then how can people support your campaign? So the big days, uh, technically March 5th is right now the primary, but obviously uh, in November 6th is the election. That's the big day. And yeah, if they can go to HernandezForCongress.com, everything at Hernandez for Congress on all my social media handles, you'll be able to find me. Um, you know, if you can donate, if you can uh, call me, reach out and coordinate so that we can walk together, work together. I think there's a message to be had. I think the Latino community being very pro-life, there was actually an Axios uh, 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 poll done that highlights that if you look at the first generation individuals, families from Mexico, they're very, very pro-life. It's only the, 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 you know, the postmodern sentiment of the, the Latino community that it isn't as much Regardless, I believe once we bring them back to their roots, we're going to unify this district to win it back. Awesome. Well, listen, Peter, I wish you the very best. I think what you're doing is heroic and so needed. And I believe there's a future for this uh, state, but it takes it's going to just take a lot of work and belief. And that's exactly what you're doing. So I hope people can support your campaign. Thanks for thanks for your work. And we're rooting for you. Thank you. God bless you, Lila. God bless you, Peter. A thank you to our sponsor, Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is America's pro-life gourmet coffee company. What I love about Seven Weeks Coffee is this is small batch gourmet, ethically roasted, low acid coffee, all kinds of delicious blends. And you know that every time you order from Seven Weeks and you drink that delicious hot steaming cup of coffee, 10% of the money that you spent directly goes to fund pro-life pregnancy resource centers. So stop buying your coffee from whatever grocery store you shop at or whatever pro-abortion conglomerate like Starbucks that you might stop at in the morning. Instead, brew your own delicious cup of coffee using seven weeks beans and know that you are fueling the pro-life movement. Head over to sevenweekscoffee.com today and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com to get your delicious steaming cup of coffee and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. Arden Young, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Lila. It's so fun to sit down with you. Yeah, it's so good to be here. And um, I've watched so much of your work and the undercover work that Live Action has done has been very inspiring. Good. Well, I think your undercover work is awesome. And I'm excited yes. to talk about it today because people need to know what you're finding and exposing. And we're also both California girls, which I love. Yes. Yeah. Although you've defected. I, yeah, I moved away in search of a better life, but who knows? I may be back in the future. 
So where did you move away to? Initially Florida, but I'm just on the road so much yeah. that I don't know if I really live anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. A lot of Californians end up in Florida. Yes. And like Governor DeSantis, everyone's like, he's our, he's the best compared to Gavin Newsom. Like, I mean, they're, they're, they did that debate, you know, I think a couple months ago now. Yeah. You know, the war- the debate of the governors, it's like two different ways of leadership. And I will take the California coastline and the California <laughs> beauty, and I would just put DeSantis <laughs> and oh, install I him. Know. Florida can have Newsom, <laughs> and I'll put DeSantis yeah, here. No, I don't, I, w- I don't wish Newsom on anyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm excited to hear about Sound Investigations. We have a mutual friend, Eric Cochran, whom you work with, mm-hmm. and he exposed um, back in the day, Pinterest yeah. uh, listing live action and others uh, basically blocking pro life content on Pinterest because they're very pro abortion and listing us as pornography. Ironically, we're going to be talking about I pornography know. today. Yeah. Uh, but you have just done incredible work recently that's making a big impact. I want to start with your background, how you got un- into undercover work, because that's always an interesting <laughs> story and unusual. Not a lot of people do that. Yeah. So let's start there. Um, So I entered the acting world. I grew up in Los Angeles at at 12 years old. Uh, And so I thought I was going to be an actress. I was pursuing acting work. I did guest roles on shows, you know, Disney, ABC Family type of content. Um, And then as I got a little bit older in my early 20s, I kind of started to have some different opinions than other people in Hollywood had, and I wasn't really able to speak Mm -hmm. openly about Mm. them. Uh, I felt like if I did, I would lose work and essentially be just unable to work in Hollywood anymore. There are other reasons, too. I mean, I went through a lot of very inappropriate situations during my time as an actor, and... um, I was just looking for something else mm-hmm. at a certain point. So I happened to meet an undercover journalist at a party and he convinced me to get into undercover okay, work. Okay, how do you how does a person at a party say, Hi, what do you do? I'm an undercover journalist. I know, I didn't understand it. He had to like Oh, he pull said up. that. He literally yeah. said I'm an undercover journalist. I had no idea what it was. He had to pull up. Do you out yourself videos. like that at parties? I me? Mean, I mean, he, I, guess, I guess he did. Yeah, he did. He didn't care. <laughs> he was maybe trying to impress you. I maybe. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, you know, he pulls up these videos that are, you know, undercover videos, nothing I've ever seen before. And I was really impressed. And I was uh, feeling a little impulsive. And I just decided to try it. And flash forward four years later, here I am working under sound investigations and investigating Pornhub. Okay. So backing up to your acting experience, I have to ask what shows, any shows that... Yeah. I were think you the, ever on... Were, yeah, you, you can just say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the most recognizable, I would say, would be Modern Family. Okay. And then I did Blackish. Okay. Fresh off the boat, of course. Got it. Nice. <laughs> I did a Disney show called Kicking It and, you know, NCIS LA, things like that, where it was like shows that ran a really long time. Yeah. And, yeah. But your experience, it sounds like you said in the industry, there were lots of, you, I think you used a word, inappropriate situations even that you had to face. And then obviously yeah. the worldview of people was, sounds like it was increasingly different than yours. Yeah. Uh, I... You know, the industry, the entertainment industry is just really hypersexualized, mm-hmm. even to children. And I, I became very brainwashed, I think, through all of that. Um, I, I came to believe as a young kid that I needed to be sexual or sexually appealing in order to be valuable to others. Um, and that started when I was 12, when I entered the industry. So I was catering uh, how I was dressing and acting to basically appeal to older men. And it was very destructive to my self-worth and my confidence mm-hmm. and just everything in my life. So uh, as I got older, I gained some maturity and I gained some worldview on just that there are more important things going on in the world than Arden being on a new show. (laughs) And I began to care about larger issues, um, including sexual exploitation. So what sparked that for you, starting to care about sexual exploitation? Um, 
especially of kids and yeah, young children? Yeah, I think witnessing a lot myself. Um, you know, I just for example, like I was in a children's acting class where the adult teacher had me and another 13-year-old girl make out very sexually on a couch many, many times in front of him. And um, he later solicited me for sex when I was about 15 or 16. And, you know, fill in the blank, so many different stories like that either. And it was under the guise of acting. I mean, that's what he was telling you as a 13-year-old. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. He said, you know, this is the scene you're doing. So, you know, act it out type of thing. And so many situations like that. I I was one of the lucky ones. I witnessed and uh, heard about much worse. But I started to notice an issue with how sexual, very, very young kids were becoming just through, under the guise of acting, right? So I think that's what planted the seed to make me care about sexual exploitation. So when you joined Eric Cochran at Sound Investigations, this is a new organization. Yes. The not-for-profit, if yes. I understand correctly. Yeah, non-profit. And Eric had done this great work before you joined him. How did the, tell me about the genesis of, hey, we're going to go explore, expose Pornhub. Yeah, well, uh, investigating the adult industry is something that Eric's wanted to do for a long time now. Um And about a year ago, I guess he just finally got the resources together to form the organization. And he called me and said, hey, are you available to do some undercover work into Pornhub? Here, read this article from the New York Times that was written in 2020, uh, The Children of Pornhub. And it details these underage victims' abuse videos being monetized on Pornhub and all of their struggles to contact Pornhub to try to get them taken down. Um, And just reading about that was mind-blowing because I always believed the pornography industry was an evil and didn't have anyone's best interests at heart. But I don't think I was aware of how predatory it really was until I read that article. So I read that and I said, yeah, let's do it. And this is a complete passion project of both of ours. Eric is literally, you know, self-funding this entire thing so far. We haven't, we didn't solicit any donations from any like large money groups for anything. We just wanted to prove that we could do this. So this is both of our babies. Well, you definitely proved that you can do amazing things with this investigation. Thank you. It went viral, the first video. We were really proud to put it up on our platforms Thanks. and share it because it was so compelling. Let's walk through. Give us the very high level of what your approach was to expose Pornhub's exploitation of children. Mm-hmm. And then I want to actually watch some of the video with you and let our audience hear some of that video. Yeah, absolutely. One of the first videos you released. Yeah, I mean, it. Sounds crazy simple. We literally just checked up who works at MindGeek, which at the time was the parent company of Pornhub. They have now changed the name to ALO. So um, we're looking at who works for ALO, essentially. And we just used publicly available information to find who their employees were. And we thought of a few different creative ways we could get in touch with each of them. And we ended up speaking total, I think, with about a dozen employees. Okay, let's do some video viewing together now and good. share it with folks listening. So this is the first video released in the series from Sound Investigations. Um, any Anything else people should know before they watch? we watch this together? Um, no, this first video, it uh, features Mike Farley. He is an 11-year employee at Pornhub. He's the product manager there, and he was the number seven employee to ever be hired. Wow. And how big is Pornhub? Pornhub, it, it's hard to say. Speaking of, about the parent company, ALO, I believe they have like between one and 3,000 employees. I don't know the exact number, but they're scattered kind of all around the world. It's one of the leading porn sites, though. Yeah, I think it still stands as the number eight most visited website in the entire world. Wow. It has a monopoly over North American porn in general. They own hundreds of different pornography websites. They do everything from 
right to shoot um, the pornography. They distribute it. They have their own in-house ads network. Their competitors come to them for consulting. They have a monopoly. It's, I think, I would even venture to say, almost impossible to watch online pornography in North America without giving business or giving a view to ALO, the parent company. Wow. They are the Planned Parenthood of the porn industry. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good way to say it. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Are you going to tell me, like, who's in that video of the girls rushing on her face? Like, that would hold it. Like, that would be the loophole that I always think. I look at that and I'm like, that's good. But everybody's just kind of rolling with it. Why are they just roll with it? Why don't they say something? <laughs> Plus, much. Who exploits the loophole? Everybody. Everyone. To make a lot of money. You rapists use it, or of course, of course. We've brought it up to the CEO. We brought it up to the CEO, and they're both telling us it's all good. And the CEO is especially telling us like, "Off, it's all good." Like, stop. Do they know that? Like, sh- like, like, shut up. No, like, stop. We're not gonna get caught. It's fine. Like, uh, like, what if like, like the government was to find out about this loophole? What would they do? They're not gonna do. Sh- they don't know. They don't qualify to identify. Meet Mike Farley. Farley is a product manager at Pornhub, who has been working at Pornhub for more than ten years. Do you think anything slips through the cracks? Of course. I'm sure. Sorry. How? I don't know because at the end of the day, it's like. Are you going to tell me, like, who's in that video of the girls rushing on her face? So someone could still lie and get around it? Because it's stupid, because it's like, I could be a content uploader, and I, the only thing you need from me is, like, you don't need a picture of my dick, but my dick, right? My driver's license, which has my face on it, but has just my face on it. You don't see my body. And now my videos never have my face. You can't really guarantee right. that. That would be the loophole that I always think. I look at that and it's like, that's like this, but everybody's just kind of rolling with it. Why do they just roll with it? Why do they say something? Plus money. It would be counterintuitive for business. Okay, so what's so incredible about this? Let's let's actually break this down for people listening. Mm-hmm. There's people watching this, and there's also people listening on podcast right now. Yeah, you can kind of hear what he's saying. He's talking about loopholes. He's talking about how you can't really verify someone saying that this is my content because it's supposed to be user generated, yes. supposedly some of it. And the problem is, you have these minors who get their videos uploaded, these children, mm-hmm. and they have no recourse, and they're victimized again and again. So help us walk us through what Mike Farley is saying how Pornhub sees their loophole here to allow, basically profit off of kid children being exploited on their site. Yeah, so at the time of this video, uh, this video was recorded last year in 2023, and at the time, to upload a video to Pornhub, you had to verify your identity within the portal Um, And so that included submitting a government-issued ID. And what Mike here is saying is there is a loophole where as an uploader, when their content moderation team is reviewing these uploads, there is no way for them to match a face on your ID to your body in a pornographic video since many of the pornographic videos on the platform never show a face. Um, He says this is very common. So basically, it's just a bunch of guesswork. Uh, And later in the video, he goes, I ask him, you know, do rapists use this loophole? Do traffickers use this loophole? And he says, yes, of course, to make money, of course. So there are people out there that they are aware of exploiting this, this loophole, uploading an ID, and just uploading random pornographic videos that contain uh, child abuse content to make money. So he says, if I remember correctly in the video, he at one point says, you know, he, I I don't know if he's trying to be like the good guy, but he basically like, he elevated this to his bosses. And what did, what did he say happened? Yeah. So he was very aware of this loophole and didn't want to go down for it should 
the public find out about it or the government find out about it. So he sat down and recorded a meeting with the CLO, the chief legal officer, and the CPO, the chief product officer. He secretly recorded it. I believe it was just an open... Okay, that, open That's recording. the way I took it. Okay. Um, just because he wanted it on the record that he addressed this and it's not his fault if it goes unaddressed. And in his words, they told him to F off and shut up. So they knowingly are operating with this loophole, people exploiting it, uploading all sorts of illegal videos, um, child abuse content, and they're, they didn't want to do anything about it because it would cut into their profits. I mean, it's hard to, I kind of, I mean, I know the answer you're going to have to this question, but I want to ask it anyways, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, Pornhub, Pornhub is such a sleazy company. They're profiting off of objectification of human beings, period, sexual objectification. Were you surprised <laughs> when one of their top staffers admit this to you, so, admits this to you so candidly on undercover camera that there's a loophole and yes, rapists are using the site to exploit children? Um, I guess I was surprised at the specificity in which he explained it. I wasn't I hadn't really thought about this loophole or the possibility of this specific loophole before. So I guess you could say, in a way, I was pleasantly surprised about the specificity of his explanation, just because we strongly suspected it was happening. And so it was almost, it was a good thing that we actually got the admission. Yeah, so you weren't surprised that this was happening, but it's surprising how quick he was to just yeah. This tell was you. our first meeting. You wow. sit here, and we only met two times total. So wow, it's it's almost. I get the sense that he's almost unburdening himself a little bit. Yeah, I really don't think these employees are used to people wanting to know about their work. Um, a few of them told me that they're used to people actually rejecting them or not wanting to uh, associate with them because of where they work. Thank you so much to our sponsor, everylife.com. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper and wipes company, and it's America's pro-life baby wipes and diaper company. You're going to love the product of Every Life because it's a best in class, great quality product of baby diapers and wipes for your little one. But you're also going to love that this is a company that aligns with your values and donates money back to the pro-life movement. So check out everylife.com today. You can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order and help be part of not only taking care of your little one, but fueling the pro-life movement. That's everylife.com. So what was it like? Okay, so you get you film this footage, you film, you, or you do how many other conversations with other staffers at Pornhub? Oh, man. Um... I think I had, so I spoke with probably a dozen different staffers, probably, you know, eight or so in-person meetings with them. And then some were phone calls, some were virtual kind of calls. And then how many, what other, what other revelations came out of those conversations alongside this huge bombshell of, yes, there's a loophole when it comes to child exploitation content and we know about it and we don't care. A lot. So we um, got several reports of very poor content moderation, especially when it came to the pornographic ads being uploaded by advertisers onto Pornhub. They have their own in-house ad platform called Traffic Junkie that any advertiser can just upload videos or images to. And one of these compliance employees for Traffic Junkie said um, that one of the criteria they used internally to determine if a girl was underage or not was if she was wearing makeup or if she had a piercing or if she had any type of tattoo. Then they would say, okay, she's 18 or over, pass that through. And she had a huge problem with this. She also said they would get calls all the time from girls saying, hey, this is me in an ad. I didn't consent to this. Please take this down. Um, And she said, they very well could have some skeezy OnlyFans manager of underage girls advertising on the platform, and they would never know. When they get that call from a girl saying, this is me, and especially if it's an underage girl, but any girl saying, I don't want this, this was done against my will, what does, what's their policy? According to her, if you escalate any issue, all you're going to get is lip service. And that's why she decided to quit, because she didn't feel like 
in good conscience, she could participate in working for the company anymore. Um, another admission we got from a senior sc- script writer for a low, he writes the pornographic scripts. Um, he said that the actors who appear to be about 15 years old, uh, they their ads perform the best. They do the most conversion rates because it draws pedophiles that they can turn into whales or big spenders, and it also draws young teens. Um, and another disturbing admission from him was that they purposefully advertise gay, bi, and trans pornography to historically straight viewers in order to, quote, convert them in a marketing sense, I believe, is how he meant that. But effectually, it kind of means the same thing, right? They're they're trying to manipulate someone's sexuality, and I think that's really predatory. That is so dark. Yeah. I mean, starting with the first thing you said about the 15-year-olds, and the fact that this is happening, mm-hmm. and technically it's illegal. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah. Thank God some pornography is illegal, Pornogra- pornographic exploitation of children. That's illegal today. But regardless of that fact, child sexual abuse material is proliferating online. It's yeah, Every year it increases. And it's even being normalized in an unfortunately technically legal way if you have, you know, a 20-year-old actor who looks super, super young. Um, and so they craft these situations in the pornographic video where it appears to be like an older woman with this young boy. Um, and they do that purposefully because it draws a huge audience and it's technically legal But I think it's really damaging because it normalizes these predatory situations. So how many videos have you released total now exposing Pornhub? We've released a total of seven full-length undercover videos. We did another mini-release, so technically eight. Uh, The mini-release was kind of interesting. That same senior scriptwriter tells me that ALO hires psychologists just to satisfy like banks and credit cards as almost it, it's just like performative they say you know oh this is ethical this is unethical and the banks and credit cards have someone to point to just so they have an excuse to still do business with alo um and it's really hypocritical because they're not allowed to have any type of depiction of alcohol in any of the pornographic videos, even a glass of wine. It's a huge no-no. They can't even, they can't do that. What about smoking? I don't know about smoking. Um, but, you know, the teen category, the incest category are some of the most popular on the platform. So how do you justify the fact that alcohol is not ethical, but teen And um, incest is. That just doesn't make any sense. It's insane. So when you first put out these videos, what was the response? And when did you first release? We began releasing in September of 2023, just last year. Um, And initially, of course, Pornhub's lawyers are very angry with us. We've been threatened legally several times by them. Um. But as far as the public reaction, you know, 26 state attorneys general have issued a joint letter to ALO, the parent company of Pornhub, demanding changes. What changes are they demanding? They want transparency about the loophole addressed in in the first video release. But unfortunately, Pornhub never responded. They just completely disregarded U.S. state attorneys general, which is mind-blowing to me. So we need to have follow through on that. And that's what we intend to work on. Um, And our undercover videos have been cited as evidence in class action suits against ALO for their involvement in sex trafficking. So hopefully our videos will help these victims get the justice that they deserve. It's crazy. And so what do you think is the, the solution here? Because Like you said, Pornhub didn't even respond to the letters from the attorneys general. I'm not surprised by that, by the way. We've, I think we've generated things like that in the past with Planned Parenthood and they're just like, well, if you can't directly touch us, we're going to keep doing what we're going to do. 
So they operate with this impunity because they're not being, you know, they're not being held accountable. Um, what what is the pathway legally to hold Pornhub accountable for this? Well, you know, and to shut them down. Quite frankly, they, yeah. they need to be shut down. Yeah, there is a very recent criminal case out of the Eastern District of New York, and Pornhub did admit to profiting off of sex trafficking. But unfortunately, they received a slap on the wrist. They got put on like a three-year probationary period where if any evidence of further sex trafficking on their platform is found, then their criminal charges have to be permanent. So at the end of these three years, if nothing's found, their charges will be dropped. Um, So Pornhub is scared. They're, they are actually sweating right now. We see that because of what they're doing lately. So just last week, they revised their upload policy to Pornhub. So now each participant in a video has to be verified for age and consent. Um, How? How does one do that? It, they no, it's the loophole. It, right? So as far as I know, it's the ID and like written consent. So that still doesn't address the loophole. And it also, meaning you have to upload a paper of them, right? I believe so. Yeah. How do they know it was written by exactly. the person in the ID? And no, it doesn't make the body. sense to me. Um, and it also doesn't apply retroactively. So it's only to new videos. It doesn't apply to their ad platform. So the pornographic ads, they don't require any verification of identity, of age, of anyone in a pornographic video. I posed as an advertiser and called into their ad platform and said, I have all these videos of young girls. They look like they could be underage. What should I do? And they said, go ahead and upload them anyway. We decide whether someone's underage or not. And if we do deem them to be underage, we'll just let you know and we're not going to hurt your account. And we also do not report to law enforcement. That right there, I mean, there are tr- there are reporting laws. You know, typically they're guardian relationships or they're like, you know, a nurse or they're someone who can have contact with a child and who would be aware or made aware of child sexual abuse taking place. And then there, it triggers a report. I mean, obviously, if somebody, you know, n- is getting uploads like at Pornhub and they can see that there may be children involved, you'd think that they should be required to report that. You would that would think be a, so. That would be a yeah. bright red flag. Yeah, you would think so. There's so many um, weird gray areas I don't really understand. Um, I think there's a reason why Pornhub is not based in the U.S. They're based in Canada, and they operate offices in, like, Eastern Europe as well. So uh, I, I, I hope there are black and white laws where they could easily be charged and held accountable. But so far, it really doesn't seem like there are. Do you think porn should be banned? In a better world, porn wouldn't exist. But I think what's realistic to say is that changing cultural paradigms surrounding porn porn would be the most effective and realistic solution to our current problems. But do you think Pornhub should be banned yes, from I continuing to operate? Absolutely. Pornhub should be criminally charged and their executives should be behind bars. Period. They have operated too long illegally hosting abuse content. And not only of children, we have revenge porn, we have voyeurism, um, we have date rapes being monetized. And there's no concern. I mean, Mike Farley said on tape, you know, there was a time when we would go through videos and the only videos we would reject were where someone was literally getting murdered. They just let everything through. They've operated too long. They shouldn't be able to be a legitimate business. And Pornhub recently stopped operating in, I think, Utah. Yes. Explain what's happening there for folks. Yeah, so across the U.S. and a bunch of different states, uh, these states are passing ID verification laws where now if you want to log on to a site like Pornhub to be a user, you have to verify your age by putting in an ID. Um, And at first, I think the first state was Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so Pornhub complied with Louisiana's ID law, and they reported an 80% drop in traffic to the site. 
wow. when people have to verify their age. Wow. So next was Utah, and Pornhub just decided to essentially strike and say, well, we're, we're going to make ourselves unavailable for Utah users. And we have more and more states passing these laws. I think we have Virginia, uh, North Carolina, we have Texas, uh, several more states. And each time Pornhub has said, well, then we're going to be unavailable in your state because this is detrimental to our business, having to verify age. And to clarify, this is verify age for people to just use to the just site watch to consume as pornography users, yeah. as opposed to the loophole process of, yeah, you need an ID to upload pornography, but yeah. it could be the pornography of someone else and it's your ID. Yeah. So these ID laws are for viewers specifically. Yeah. So it's a lot of underage viewers. that Many underage viewers. Um, and in the undercover videos, there is one video about viewers of pornography, children as viewers. And we have employees who express encouragement for children as young as 12 to watch pornography saying, they could find their kink on a site like men.com, which is an ALO owned site. Um, a 12 year old could benefit from watching trans angels if they're confused or want to explore their sexuality. So many of these employees don't even care if children watch the site. And that is apparent because when you go on the site, their age verification is you check a box that says I'm 18. <laughs> I mean, it's sexual abuse to expose a, a minor to porn. It is 100% period. Yeah, sexual abuse to expose a minor to porn. Okay, what's what's it been like for you, Arden? You're, you're on the road a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, these videos have reached a lot of people. They've inspired action, which is awesome. Congratulations on that. I know you're just getting started. What's life been like for you the last few months? Uh, really unexpected and crazy, but really good. Um, I... I was expecting me becoming public and talking about this to be a big sacrifice, and in a way it has, mm -hmm. right? But something I didn't realize was that I'd be gaining such a wonderful community and so many people who care about these issues like you. And um, so it's been overwhelmingly positive, to be honest, just busy, but in a good way. It's awesome. Yeah. And then what's next for you and Sound Investigations and Eric? Yeah, well, we hope to expand. Um, we are still really small. It's just us two. Eric has completely self-funded this project. So we will be looking for people who want to support us uh, to be able to keep going. Uh, we really want to do a lot of follow through with um, these attorneys general and some lawmakers who expressed interest and holding Pornhub accountable, but it takes so much time and follow through that we want to be able to focus on that for a bit. Yeah. And one last thing on the law, because I do think, you know, you said earlier, they should be shut down. You know, this is all mm -hmm. criminal. What additional law or laws need to be passed Yeah, for this to fix not just loopholes, but to really make sure justice happens and, and especially young, young children are protected? Yeah. Um, Section 230 must be amended. Section 230 essentially grants big tech platforms immunity from being sued for hosting content on their sites. So Pornhub, their parent company, ALO, has kind of grouped themselves in and in, in calling themselves a tech platform rather than part of the adult industry, right? And are claiming immunity under Section 230. So I really think we need... Um, we need the ability to be able to at least pursue charges if a site like Pornhub is hosting underage content. It takes so much. It takes a big class action to be able to do that now. And I think if individual victims are able to pursue justice against a site like Pornhub, then that would really help. You might you might end up Getting that accomplished, that's been Incredible. talked about now for yeah. a few years. And yeah, the fact that they operate Facebook and these other platforms with impunity, they get to put up whatever content and, by the way, censor the content. That's yes. the part that they claim they're a publisher and under 230, they can operate with protections of not being liable for anything on their sites. But then they do call balls and strikes yeah. about the content that people see through the algorithm or they censor content like pro-life content on Pinterest, mm -hmm. you know, as Eric originally found. Um, and they can't have it both ways. Right. And I'm sure you face this a lot, but 
all the major tech platforms are heavily censoring our content and the I, content of sound investigations. Yeah, of sound investigations. How so? Tell me what what does that look like for you? Uh, I'm currently shadow banned across pretty much every platform. People have to type in my full handle to even find my page. I was demonetized on Twitter just without notice, just randomly. So Gotta tag Elon. I know. Um I don't know what it is. It's just it's I guess it's very controversial, but yet we have accounts on Twitter literally posting pornography who I'm sure are making money from it. So or else why would they do it, right? So the fact that I'm trying to raise awareness about this stuff and I'm demonetized and there's pornographic, you know, content on Twitter. It's just kind of a clown world situation. Absolutely. Okay. How can people follow you on your yes. shadow plan platforms? And then also not just follow you there, but how can they support Sound Investigations? Yeah. So you can keep doing this very important work. So they can go to soundinvestigations.com slash donate to support us and everything helps. And we so appreciate it because we want to be able to continue. And on Twitter, I would say it's probably my most active platform. I am Arden underscore young underscore. I'm the same on Instagram. And then you'll see if you go to my Twitter, the Sound Investigations Twitter page is in my bio, so they can follow there as well. Awesome. And I hope people also subscribe to your YouTube channel. Thank you. You, yes. you guys put stuff up there regularly, and it's first to YouTube. release on there, right? Yeah, we post on YouTube uh, Sound Investigations. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Arden, you're doing amazing work. Thank you. I'm very, very encouraged by what you're doing and admire it. Keep it up. Thank We're you cheering so for you and, you know, say hello to Eric. Tell him he's amazing <laughs> and keep it up. Thank you so much, Lila. I appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. I hope you're encouraged by Peter Hernandez and Arden Young. I'm excited to bring you more people that are going to inspire you that are really culture makers and culture warriors. The reality is we're living in a very difficult time and in some ways a dark time when it comes to moral issues in the West. But my hope and my belief is that when enough of us rise up, stand up, speak the truth, act courageously, take initiative, we can be the change that we need to see out in the culture. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Lila Rose podcast. Don't forget to join our Patreon or our locals. If you want to support this show, if you like what we're doing, if you want us to grow and reach more people, you can sign up at Patreon or locals. Even $10 a month, $5 a month helps the podcast reach more people. Thank you so much for your support, and we'll see you next time.